My name is Brett Sharps, and I'm the uh, director of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies at Brigham Young University. Uh, we're gathered here today at the museum for a panel discussion on the topic, Never Again, What Can Be Done to Prevent and Address Religious Persecution? We're here as part of a week-long conference on the topic of human dignity and freedom of religion or belief preventing and addressing persecution. Uh, we met on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday in Provo, Utah with a uh, delegation of about 100 uh, people from 50 countries, uh, including religious leaders, political leaders, judges, academics, and human rights activists. We're now here in Washington, D.C. for two further days of discussion. And uh, we're very grateful to have a distinguished panel of uh, very knowledgeable individuals about religious freedom, about religious persecution. And uh, we're grateful for the hospitality of the museum and the opportunity to uh, host this broadcast this morning. I'd like to begin by introducing our panelists. And our hope is to have a rather informal discussion uh, where we can uh, really talk to each other and respond uh, to each other in thinking about uh, this significant uh, issue. Immediately to my right, your left, is Jan Fagel. He is the EU Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion and Belief outside the EU, a position that he's held for the last three years. Uh, he's a uh, distinguished statesman from Slovakia, was instrumental in negotiating Slovakia's uh, entry to the European Union, and has served as a commissioner uh, of the European Union. Uh, the position that he holds from an American perspective is a little similar to Ambassador Sam Brownback, the US Ambassador for Religious Freedom, or before that, during the Obama administration, David Saperstein. And, uh, uh, Mr. Fagel works closely with them and with uh, many other government and non-government officials around the world uh, who are thinking about and serious about uh, freedom of thought, conscience, and belief for all people in all places. Uh, Christina Ariaga is a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom. This is an independent government agency that is tasked with monitoring and reporting on religious freedom around the world. Uh, and uh, Christina has been serving on that commission for several years. Before that, she was uh, president of Beckett, also known as the Beckett Fund, uh, one of the premier litigation uh, law firms defending the rights of freedom of religion and belief for people of all uh, religious persuasions. Uh, finally, uh, Roger Karstens is with us. He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor in the U.S. Department of State. So his portfolio includes uh, human rights, and uh, he thinks of this uh, and works on this primarily from a uh, State Department Foreign Service uh, perspective. So let me ask you to join me in welcoming our guests. This week, we've been talking a lot about religious persecution. One thing we want to do is be thoughtful, if not entirely precise, uh, with our definitions, uh, because there is no globally accepted international law definition of persecution. But when we speak of persecution, we're trying to focus on systematic mistreatment of individuals or groups based upon their religious identity or their lack of religious identity. Our concern for persecution is not just for persecution of religious believers, but also those who might be persecuted uh, for not being religious believers. At one end of the spectrum, we have genocide, atrocities, forced migration, and those might even 
be more serious abuses than what we think of when we talk about persecution, although persecution often, perhaps, uh, descends into these more serious forms of uh, mistreatment. Persecution is also something different than just discrimination or marginalization or uh, feeling offended or uh, feeling uh, left out. Uh, and so we do want to distinguish discrimination and even marginalization from persecution. And so what we're thinking about and focusing on today are these serious and systematic uh, examples of mistreatment. And perhaps I can set the stage by just reflecting with you for a moment on how noteworthy it is that at this moment in the world's history, we're still dealing with many examples of religious persecution around the world. Uh, when the nations of the earth came together at the end of World War II, the overwhelming sense was one of never again that the type of persecution that we had seen in the Holocaust with the mistreatment of Jews, the annihilation of Jews, the genocide of Jews, and others as well, as well as the uh, atrocities committed by uh, the Japanese imperial armies in Asia, there was a strong global consensus that we wanted to take a different road. We wanted something different. We didn't want to be in another world war 20 years later as we had found ourselves after World War I. And so the global community came together and rallied around the idea of human rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, as well as conventions against genocide and many treaties addressing persecution <coughs> of a variety of types, including religious persecution, were enacted by the global community. And yet, today, as we look around the world, we do see still large-scale religious persecution. For example, uh, in Myanmar, the uh, uh, perhaps genocide, uh, mass migration of nearly a million Rohingya Muslims is uh, something that has shocked the conscience of uh, the world. And it's not just uh, Muslims, the Rohingya in uh, Myanmar who are very nervous. Uh, Christian communities, often ethnic, such as the Kitchen uh, religious minority, uh, Christian communities are also uh, uh, very fearful. In Iraq, we've seen uh, terrible uh, atrocities at the hands of ISIS, including what is perhaps accurately described as a genocide uh, against the Yazidi religious community, as well as Christian communities. And even very recently in Nigeria, we see calls for uh, the eradication of entire groups of people based upon their religious identity. Sometimes it's difficult to know how to characterize these. Uh, sometimes it seems like a dispute between North and South, or between Muslims and Christians, or even an old dispute, what we would describe in the United States as ranchers versus farmers, uh, but certainly there's an important religious dimension to what's happening in, in Nigeria, and it's certainly something that we're uh, concerned about. The broader treatment of Christians through the Middle East is shocking, uh, and this isn't a new problem. Over the last hundred years, uh, the percentage of Christians in the Middle East has declined from about 25% to 5% of the population. And there are countries, many countries in the Middle East, where Christians are fearful, fleeing, or uh, simply trying to endure uh, social and legal uh, marginalization and persecution. And it's not just Christians, of course, one of the 
really dramatic examples of religious persecution in the world today is the treatment of Uyghur Muslims in China, where the estimates vary. We don't really know, but one million, two million, three million, I've heard all of these numbers from serious uh, observers. The number of Muslims who are subject to re-education camps, unlike anything we've seen since the dark days of the Cultural Revolution. And uh, we as a global community don't even really have all the facts to completely understand uh, what's happening. And China's a big country, but we're worried about other big countries as well. In India, we see resurgent Hindu nationalism and our friends in the Muslim communities and Christian communities in India, who for years have defended models of uh, Indian secularism, now describe themselves as simply being fearful uh, about their own safety and uh, what they're facing as religious minorities in India. In Russia, uh, non-Orthodox Christians are worried as well as non-Christian groups, but especially for small religious communities, particularly those who are affiliated with Western uh, organizations, uh, the levels of persecution are rising and are worrisome. We think especially of groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, who are suffering significant persecution in Russia. And Indonesia as well, a country that is a Muslim-majority country, but where ascendant forms of Islamist thinking uh, are increasingly opposed to the national ideology of Panchasila and embracing forms of Islamism that are quite exclusive and uh, create uh, genuine and valid concern on the part of Christian communities but also, also atheists uh, who can suffer significant persecution uh, in Indonesia. I don't mean to, with this litany, uh, suggest that these are the darkest days. Uh, by some measures, uh, the number of people who are being killed as a result of their religious beliefs is lower than it's been at many times, including uh, times during post-World War II history. So it's not our project to be alarmist or to suggest that things are worse than they've ever been. But it is noteworthy that at a time when our ability to communicate with each other and technology is more advanced than it's ever been, our ability to travel is better than it's ever been. Uh, the wealth of the world is higher than it's ever been. When uh, the ability to communicate between communities that are a majority in one country, but perhaps a small minority in other countries, is better than it's ever been, we still see that persecution is a persistent problem. It seems that never again has become again and again. And so I'd like to begin by asking our panelists to reflect each. Uh, Roger, perhaps I can start with you on this question of why is religious persecution, not just religious persecution, but as a subset of other uh, related forms of persecution based upon things like ethnicity and language, um, race. Why is this such a persistent problem? Why are we still grappling with this in such a serious and systematic way? Well, first off, Brett, thank you for inviting me here today. And uh, I want to let you know from the outset, I'm, I already have a warm feeling towards you and this group. My wife is a 1996 graduate of BYU. Mm. She served her Mormon mission in the Ukraine. So, of course, we're at home waiting for her to be subpoenaed any day. So there's a lot of uh, drama <laughs> in the household right now. So thankfully, she's a Democrat. We have a mixed marriage. She's a Democrat. I'm a Republican. So we're, I think we're, we're, hope we're hopefully we're safe there. Uh, but, you know, uh, I wouldn't mind just starting out by just uh, uh, taking 
maybe 45 seconds to tell you a little bit about uh, what I uh, personally got drawn into this arena uh, with or from. But uh, in, when I was 11 years old, I remember 1975 reading about the Cambodian genocide. Uh, kind of young to be reading about a heavy topic like that, but for whatever reason, it interested me. I felt great heart pain. I didn't know anything about the United Nations back then or NGOs or anything. So when it came time to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, to me, I joined the greatest human rights organization that ever existed, the organization that's freed more people on earth than I think any other in history. I joined the Army. <laughs> so from the United States Army, I went to eventually made my way into Special Forces, and I well remember in uh, early April of 1994 being in an aircraft hangar in Stuttgart, Germany, spending three days doing nothing but planning for a mission to go down to Kigali, Rwanda, seize the airport, get the Americans out, and then uh, uh, open the airport for follow-on forces. And of course, that, that order never came. After three days, they sent us home. And uh, I think we were all exhausted because when you plan, you really plan. You know, you're up 24 seven trying to make sure you have the latest maps and intelligence and, uh, and get a sense of how you're gonna conduct the mission. But I remember going home after three days of not sleeping and planning and plopping down on my couch in Stuttgart, Germany, turning on the TV and the first thing I saw, bodies were floating down one of the tributaries in, in, in Rwanda. And I remember at that time, I was probably about 30 years old, I just broke out and started crying like a baby, just weeping huge tears because it was such, just such an, a powerful, impactful event and we weren't going to do anything. So I was very frustrated. You know, later when I commanded a special forces company in Kosovo, flying in a helicopter over villages that had just been burned out during the, uh, the, the conflict that was uh, there when one side was trying to essentially erase the other from the landscape. So I like to think I come at this from a very personal level, and I was very grateful that uh, I ended up in DRL, uh, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the State Department. This is part of our portfolio. Uh, and uh, the question that you asked, though, is, is how does religious persecution tie into this, and why does it keep happening? Uh, sadly, uh, you almost think it's part of the human condition. You know, it's, uh, people have long-standing grievances, uh, there are all sorts of drivers of conflict. Sometimes there are different power plays that are taking place, and religion's either a real part of that driver or it's just used as an excuse to drive the others out. Uh, and we, of course, in DRL, we're trying to take a very broad look at this and take a look at how religious persecution ties into mass atrocities or genocide writ large. And when we take a look at it, we try to take, uh, see the data and the trends because if religious persecution has taken place at, w at one time, there's a chance that it's going to take place again. So what can we do as a nation with our allies to prevent or mitigate anything that's coming onto the scene? And naturally, we don't want to get to the point where we're, uh, we're doing, uh, are taking efforts to respond to something that's already happened. We really do want to get in front of it. Uh, so how does it tie into the bigger, the bigger picture? I mean, obviously, when you sense that there's hate speech, gender-based violence, marginalization of people based on their ethnicity, ethnicities or religion, you can see that there's a problem and you want to get ahead of it. And I'll wrap up in another 30 seconds. I want to make sure that you guys have a chance to say something. Um, we're working hard through, uh, as you can tell, by our national security strategy that came out in 2017. We made this a priority. The president, in his speech at the Holocaust Museum, said he wants to see, uh, he wants to ensure that this never ever happens again. And we've taken such steps as responding to co the congressional uh, legislation in the uh, Elie Wiesel Ant uh, Genocide Prevention Act. We uh, just met in Geneva just last week uh, to, with the Atrocities uh, Prevention Working Group, a group of like-minded nations where we talk about how we can get ahead of this. And even our, our own National Security Council, they have the uh, early Atrocities Early Warning Prevention Task Force and so from the interagency, we can have a whole of government approach to really try to take a look at those indicators that will allow us to get ahead of it and try to either use, in our case, work with our buddies at the Office of uh, International Religious Freedom, uh, Ambassador Sam Brownback, to find ways to send money and programs down to get on the ground with the NGOs on the ground to get ahead of these issues, especially in the areas of religious persecution, because as you well know, once that match has been thrown onto the fire, that thing can burn very quickly, very hot, and very fast. So again, our goal is to get ahead of it. And why it happens, um, again, I, I sometimes uh, have to say just uh, from a personal view, it just seems like it's, it's that part of the human nature that is always striving for power, maybe not understanding what the other side is like. And, and yet that's never an excuse. You know, you can't just say it's a persistent problem. You know, it'll never happen again, and yet it happens again, and yet it happens again. 
our job is still to do everything we possibly can to make sure that that doesn't happen. Because it's a big problem, doesn't mean that we don't stop our efforts. So Roger, before I turn to Christina, let me just ask you uh, a little bit more about the early indicators that, you're, uh, that you mentioned. What, what are some of those things that you look at or that you notice that might be uh, warning signs that something is about to erupt into a conflict where people are really being hurt, killed, displaced, versus something which is maybe less dramatic? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I actually mentioned two of them. Uh, when you take a look at, uh, as you said, there are places where you, you just know something is on the verge of happening because the huge indicators are already present. But in other places, and I, I'd love to mention the countries that we're, we're kind of following right now, but I won't. But we're looking at things like what's coming out in the newspaper? What kind of hate speech is coming out? You know, we, we want people, of course, to have freedom of expression and to air their views. But when you start reading opinion pieces in certain countries and it's continually filled with hate speech, or the statistics are starting to show an increase in gender-based violence, or they're starting to show small incidents where people of a certain ethnicity or religion are now being targeted by certain groups, the statistics start to add up and you can start to paint a picture a little bit early and that's where we might take a look at what kind of programming, you know, and programming meaning how can we perhaps send money down to a nonprofit, an NGO on the ground, uh, an organization that has a little more fidelity as to what might be done to kind of turn things in the right direction or keep things at a low boil, at the same time hitting it from high angles too. Because there's not a place on earth where something is not starting to come to uh, the fore where our ambassador is not talking to his counterpart or the president's not bringing it up in a phone call. So we really do try to hit things in a whole of government approach with a lot of different, uh, 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 I guess, actions. But the key is when we start seeing just those little indicators, in some, you know, there are, I'm thinking of a, sp a specific country in Africa right now where life was good, very calm, and yet in the last year or so, we've started to catch some of these small things that you're noticing, yeah. and we want to get ahead of that, so. Yeah, that's really interesting. At our symposium in Provo, one of our participants noted, I thought in a very profound way that persecution takes organization and planning. It does. Uh, and yeah. so uh, maybe we have to be organized and planning ourselves, those mm -hmm. of us who uh, seek to address this and respond to it. I mean, you think about, I know you have another question, but you think about Rwanda, and that's a good example. <clears throat> all the planning that went into that months and months and months ahead of the uh, actual genocide. Uh, there are all sorts of indicators, and they were either ignored, not seen, or we didn't quite understand what the picture was. And I think it's the third. I think in taking a look at everything, no one was able to really step back and see those minor indicators to realize that something big was about to happen. So to your point. Very interesting. So Ms. Ariaga, Christina. Uh, What's your perspective on this question of why such a persistent problem? Why are we still grappling with this? Well, thank you. And uh, competing with uh, Roger here, I'm an honorary member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints <laughs> because I have so many good LDS friends, so I also feel very warmly welcomed <laughs> here. Um, my husband is a Marine, and Marine and Special Forces always have a thing going, mm -hmm. so um, I really appreciate my erudite friend uh, being here. Um, why is it a persistent problem? Well, part of it has to do with definitions. And I am so glad that you started by saying, let's be careful about the way we talk about these issues, because I think there's a prevalent thinking that religious freedom is about religion. It isn't. Religious freedom protects people. It does not protect belief systems. Second, there is an impression that religious freedom is, once there's violations, there's, it's intractable. Religious freedom, uh, religious freedom problems are both preventable and certainly reversible in many countries. And religious freedom is not about who God is. Religious freedom is about who we are as human beings. And one of the reasons that after World War II, all these countries got together and imagine their situation. I mean, this is 1945, right? Um, half of the world is, is occupied in, in colonial ways. 
Uh, you have a tremendous need for food and shelter and the, the massive amounts of debt all over the world. But all of these countries thought it was so important to ensure that human dignity was central to their arguments that the state could no longer claim sovereignty over a people because we are born with those rights and that afford us the human dignity. And I think finally one of the issues that surfaced, of course, during the Holocaust, and I was just in Auschwitz uh, again uh, with the US delegation um, to the OSCE, and the depersonalization that took place during the Holocaust is beginning to take place again over a new medium, and that is social media. Facebook is the largest country in the world. There are places like in Myanmar where more people have access to Facebook than to electricity. And Facebook has been used, for instance, in Myanmar to uh, spread news about the Rohingya Muslims and ensure that they were depersonalized in such a way that they could be taken away. And it's also being used, of course, for the spread of, of fake news. And, and let me say, I speak about these issues as a person who has spent over 30 years. I started very young. I'm waiting for the translators to translate the joke so I can, they can, everyone can laugh. Um, I have spent over the last 30 years working on religious freedom issues. And while I agree with you, uh, there are many uh, improvements worldwide. Uh, there has also been a, a move of religious freedom being repressed, not only by laws and legal system, but by societal processes that are much more difficult to define and much more difficult to address. Um, I think that what your center does is so needed all over the world. We need to have more people thinking about these issues and engage, engaging academics and advocates and, and young people. And I'm pleased to say that only two years ago, the world only had one ambassador at large for religious freedom, and that was David Saperstein. There used to be two, one in Canada, but when Trudeau uh, became prime minister, he eliminated that office. But only in the last two years, we have seen the rise of diplomats like our friend Jan Fiegel, who are dedicated to religious freedom alone. And I think right now we are 13 special envoys all over the world dedicating time and effort in directing government agencies <coughs> and funding to ensure that religious freedom is protected. So I'm gonna ask about the institutional perspectives of the commission, the State Department, and the EU in just a minute. But Jan, let me give you a chance to respond to the general question of why is this such a, an intractable problem? Why are we finding it so difficult to solve it? I, I fully share, and first of all, thank you for the invitation and for this occasion to be here in the new CM and to speak about one of the key issues for today's and tomorrow's world. Uh, yes, I am first ever EU Special Envoy. I hope it will continue and it will deliver uh, more understanding, more support, more prevention uh, of atrocities which uh, in the past uh, we failed. Or I would say that uh, freedom of religion or belief uh, can be seen or it was more true in the past as abandoned orphan or something not uh, understood properly or correctly. And actually, this is the, the deepest expression of human personal freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom to believe or not to believe or to change. There is no deeper expression of human uh, freedom and dignity. And then we, if we respect this part, then we can and we do respect freedom of opinion, of media, freedom of ex expression, freedom of assembly, of association, of property but the beginning is inside of human person. And this is oppressed brutally in the most of uh, the world. Majority of uh, global population lives in countries with high and very high obstacles uh, for uh, their freedom, freedom to believe or not to believe. Um, I would say that 
this freedom is the opposite of uh, religious persecution. <coughs> so if persecution is such a vast, visible, painful, bloody problem, uh, we, um, we are weak on the side of prevention. And, and then genocide uh, prevention or the, the, the convention signed in 1948 together with the UDHR has three basic pillars. And uh, I must say that we usually fail on all three points, not only one, three Ps. It's uh, prevention, protection and punishment. Prevention of genocide, uh, protection of victims and and punishment of uh, criminals, of perpetrators. And that's also the answer. If we want to speak uh, about different future, we have to do much more in overall awareness and, and prevention through many, many uh, layers of activities, especially through education, living how to, uh, or learning how to live together, not only to exist, but to live together in diversity in today's world, which is more and more global, more and more mobile, more and more integrated. And uh, then it is of course about support or uh, protection of the victims. What's going on today in, in the Middle East uh, calls for more urgent action, real action, real assistance. And then without justice, there is no future for peace, for stability, for no repetitions. So justice is, is key towards future, towards reconciliation. I spoke a bit uh, maybe longer, but Europe, uh, and that's that's example, is real embodiment of, of such lesson. Because after 48 or after Second World War, better to say, in Western part of Europe, there were steps made in order to protect and to punish, but also to reconcile original enemies or repetitive enemies into a community of those who share principles, rules, values, interests, common ground, common future, common good. I spoke here at the podium with David Saperstein and then uh, uh, Tom Farr on common good as forgotten or missing item on international agenda. Everybody speaks my country first, my nation first, my religion first, me. Common good is good for me, for you, for us, for all. And this was the, the message of Schumann, de Gasperi, Adenauer, Bonum Commune. So we need to uh, uh, repeat good uh, functioning, real lessons of the past for positive future, and of course avoid uh, grave mistakes which, which we committed. So, that, so that's basically my answer. Um, I like this. Uh focus on uh, the relationship between persecution on the one hand and religious freedom on the other hand. It's not just that they're opposite sides of the same coin. I've heard you talk about sort of religious freedom as the canary in the coal mine. Uh, what do you mean by that analogy, Jan? Uh, religious freedom is not a bow, it's not something uh, extra, but very central, even in terms of UDHR, it's I Article 18. So it's in the middle of many articles. And actually it is a litmus test of all human rights. I lived half of my life, still half, but um, uh, under communist regime, which oppressed uh, any freedom of thought. Uh, it was indoctrination of ideology, uh, forced collectivism, and so on. So I must say that, that uh, without freedom of religion or belief, we cannot speak uh, on, on political or civil rights. And um, this litmus test is so crucial today in the world that, okay, w whatever parable we use, uh, religious freedom is important. And therefore, working for freedom of religion or belief means working for human rights. And human rights is the, the central line or objective of justice. Justice for all means respect of human rights of all. And the core or the foundational principle for all this is human dignity. 
In dignity, we are all equal. Nobody is more, whether we come from a royal family or from a homeless family. We are all equal. On the other side, we are all different because that's the principle of creature. My son is different from me, and that's fine. So all different in identity, all equal in dignity. Knowing that, respecting that, and promoting that means to build a more just world uh, for all. So I want to come back to this idea of human dignity in just a minute, but uh, Christina, let me turn to you. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about this institutional question. So uh, you've been uh, a representative, uh, a high official at the U.S. Commission of uh, International Religious Freedom, where you uh, serve now, and also at the Beckett uh, Fund, uh, a litigation law firm that defends religious freedom. Can you tell me from the, per the institutional perspectives of the commission and maybe Beckett also, what, is, what works in terms of addressing and trying to prevent persecution? Mm -hmm. So in both cases, the Beckett is a private, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, a public interest law firm. The private entity is not part of the government that defends all religions. I like to say A to Z, atheist to Zoroastrian. Why? Because religious freedom is a core issue in the United States of America and should be respected. It is as a fundamental right. What that means is that when two rights compete with each other, for instance, sexual identity and religious freedom, in the United States, you have a balancing test and each case is viewed independently and individually. There is no such thing as one is always over the other. And that's an important principle that was um, coded in a congressional statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So that's in the United States. Internationally, there is no such a balancing, balancing mechanism. In many countries, when they talk about um, Article 18 in their constitutions and in their legal frameworks, there are other <laughs> rights that are superior to freedom of religion or belief. And we see this in Western countries, we see this in Eastern countries, and therein lies a lot of the friction between people claiming that two different rights compete with each other and that religious freedom is a lesser right. And I love your analogy of a team being in the middle, which I'm going to plagiarize from you, thank you, uh, at future events, because I love that. But also Article 18 is the only right that is both an individual right and a communal right, because it includes both an individual's ability to act according to their form internum, according to their uh, insight, but also for communities to practice together. So institutionally, uh, we need a better legal framework and mechanism internationally to be able to protect religious freedom. And I think that these, the rise of these envoys are going, uh, for religious freedom are going to be really important. But also institutionally, we need countries at the United Nations Human Rights Council or at any of the international bodies not to defend despot governments, but to defend the people that are suffering. And that has so, been a, an issue. So Christina, from the perspective of the commission particularly, yeah. what works? What are you finding makes a difference? So the commission is a watchdog agency that gives recommendations to the Department of State, to Congress, and to the President on measures that can be taken to incentivize countries to respect religious freedom. What works? In some contexts, the naming and shaming works in some other contexts, working within cultures to ensure that internally there are, as you mentioned earlier, there are people who are stakeholders in the country that understand the value of religious pluralism. That unfortunately doesn't work in places like Cuba and in Russia. There, there's more a carrot approach, I'm sorry, a stick approach, but in countries where there's an emergent democracy lifting up their idea, their, their ideas on improving the economy, on improving gender issues, and also ensuring that they understand that Article 18 will help them in their goals. 
So Roger, let me turn to you since mm -hmm. you're being nudged and poked by the commission, specifically from the State Department's perspective and in even more particularly from uh, the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, what is unique or distinctive about that institution? What can you do from that platform that it's more difficult to do from any other platform? What are the unique uh, tools or approaches, uh, resources that, that you have there at the State Department? Great question, and uh, I'll start off by saying we appreciate the nudge because you know it's, it's nice to have people actually either A, holding us accountable, or B, giving us great ideas and things to follow. Uh, but the pleasure of being at the State Department is really following up on, on something that you just said, and that is, if you do the naming and shaming, well, on October 8th, Secretary Pompeo announced visa restrictions uh, against uh, members of the Communist Party and leaders in China for what's happening in Xinjiang province. Uh, additionally, uh, from the federal government side, you s perhaps have seen what the, the Department of Commerce has done with regards to Xinjiang as well. But whether it's shining the spotlight on with visa restrictions or sanctions in places like Burma or Xinjiang, uh, we have the ability to take the naming and shaming up to a high level and making it official. And in some place like even Venezuela, which is not necessarily religious persecution, you're freezing the bank accounts of people and trying to make their life harder if they're doing bad things while also you know, shining a spotlight on it and making sure we're now talking about it, that evil things are not happening in the dark, they're happening and we know about it and we're gonna talk about it. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is that uh, you also mentioned, I'm just gonna kind of riff off a few if you don't mind. You also mentioned that it's good to uh, educate and get people talking together. And uh, you know, we work with the Office of uh, uh, International Religious Freedom, Ambassador Brownback's office, uh, to uh, execute a $20 million earmark that we, we've received. We've pretty much received an earmark since 2016. And you'll note that we've had two uh, international religious ministerials held at the State Department. The second one was uh, held just a few months ago, where you're bringing together over a multi-day period members from all sorts of faiths to the State Department to spend days talking, exchanging cards, wrestling with some of the harder topics. So it's a chance to, in, in a way, have that I don't want to say the word authority, but a, a convening apparatus with the money behind it to bring people together. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, we're obviously going to have some role in the president's recently announced uh, International Religious Freedom Alliance, or as they call it, the Alliance. And as that moves forward and starts to expand and grow, I think we're going to have a role in that as well. And again, it's getting people to talk from different faiths and not only get to recognize where the other person is coming from, but also take on some of these hard problems and find ways to work together. I think lastly, uh, and I'm not sure this really gets at the question, but we want to make sure that we have those, uh, those warning uh, the, uh, outposts, as, as we were talking about. And to that end, and thankfully based on the great guidance we received in the Elie Wiesel uh, Act, we've instituted genocide prevention training at the Foreign Service Institute. So Foreign Service officers now must get this training before they uh, head off to uh, their next posts. Uh, made it very widely available. And additionally, in December, we're going to kick off our first ever genocide prevention uh, workshop. It's, a, it's an actual, uh, an event-based scenario. It's gonna be held in Johannesburg on the 9th, 10th, and 11th of December. We're inviting members of the State Department from all over the southern region of Africa to show up. And it's going to basically start at the beginning where uh, it's a, a scenario-based exercise where you're in a room and you're given little feeds, like something's now happening. What do you do? Okay, that, this is what happens in response to what you did. What's your next action? And we'll take it all the way up to the crescendo to where hopefully the people that participate will have a better sense of how this really plays out, what indicators to look for, what our responses are, and hopefully even learn from our, our, our mistakes. So, so what do we really, do? Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. I think yeah. the focus on education training uh, in the State Department is a really important point, even mm -hmm. on uh, the Office of Religious Freedom the level of awareness in the Foreign Service about the role that religion plays mm -hmm. as a factor in society has increased significantly Absolutely. Uh, since the uh, enactment of the International Religious Freedom Act. I also appreciated your uh, discussion of partnership because one of the things that I found so interesting about the ministerial is not only do you have representatives of 100 countries, but you also have civil society, yes. religious groups, the non-government actors brought into the partnership of concern as well. And that also seems to be an important part of 
what the State Department is doing institutionally in, uh, in thinking about these issues. Yesterday we heard from Dan Nadell from the Office of Religious Freedom in the State Department, and he had been working hard on the uh, ministerial, and he really emphasized this partnership concept of not just government to government, but also government to non-government mm -hmm. with religious groups and with other civil society uh, actors. So I, I, I appreciated your bringing that to our attention as well. Jan, let me turn to you. So uh, you are an official uh, of the European Union with a portfolio which is outward looking. Uh, your concern is, of course, with what's happening in the EU, but specifically your mandate is to try to think about promoting freedom of religion and belief uh, outside the EU. From that institutional perch from which you operate now, what do you find effective, uh, specifically from your institutional perspective? <clears throat> I used this uh, answer recently at the ministerial uh, because I spoke at the first, the very first panel being moderated by, by Sam Brownbeck and there was a question of the sort and my answer was we need combination of hard working, team working and networking. So it means if I want to persuade, if I want to achieve something in the system, I need to work hard because it is unprecedented uh, role in, in the European Union, which is vast and 60 years old uh, uh, organization. And I came into this uh, portfolio or agenda because of martyrdom or genocide in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I was invited after a very strong resolution being adopted by the European Parliament, naming the atrocities of genocide and of course demanding some actions, prevention. Uh, so, uh, working hard means to travel a lot, to put together uh, projects, programs, ideas, partners, religious, academic, uh, political, societal. Uh, it pays back. There is a lot of uh, interest and, and a kind of momentum now. Uh, team working means, for example, working with those who have a similar uh, missions. There are now uh, envoys not only in the States or even I would mention Canada, but uh, in many uh, European Union countries since three years, it's Hungary, Poland, Germany, United Kingdom, Lithuania, Denmark, uh, Netherlands recently, and of course we had some in Finland, in, in Sweden, Norway. So it's good to have them and it's very important to put the team together to focus on different situations, different countries, and to achieve better prospects for those who suffer. And the third is networking with like-minded, with NGOs, with people of goodwill. Yeah. So work is the common word of all three of those, mm -hmm. network, hard work, and teamwork. Uh, I like that. I've also heard you talk, Jan, about the need for climate change yeah. uh, with respect to uh, human rights discourse. And in particular, you've focused on the concept of human dignity as a way of affecting that climate change. I'm really hoping that you can tell us a little bit about your experience with the human dignity concept, perhaps specifically as it relates to Pakistan and as it relates to your good offices in helping uh, secure the uh, freedom for Asia Bibi. Uh, this is a Muslim woman who was convicted of uh, blasphemy, sentenced to death, served eight years in prison for sharing a water container with uh, some Muslim women. And this was a big problem. Uh, and it was a challenging situation for the Pakistan government to try to solve this problem. Can you tell us a little bit about human dignity and the process of how you were able to make a difference there. Right, she was a Christian woman. Um, I'm sorry, no, I misspoke. No, that's okay, I just want to make sure Yeah, I, I apologize. Thank you for the correction. I misspoke. Yes, exactly. Asya Bibi was a Christian woman who was convicted of blasphemy for sharing a water container with Muslim women. Yeah, maybe one, uh, one clarification on this uh, climate change idea. 
uh, look what's going on in environment and the response of the international community, uh, which uh, is an action for, for stopping the trends and reverting for better, hopefully. And uh, this year there was a, a new report published by the, uh, or, or commissioned by the FCO London, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, it's, which is on persecution of Christians. And it is uh, one of the reports of overall situation. And one of the messages is that the, the, this persecution today in the world is uh, the most shocking abuse of human rights of our time. So if these are realities being recognized, we need to achieve change. And therefore, we need to mobilize, motivate for religious freedom climate change or for climate change to stop the trends which are negative and revert for better. Pakistan is a good case because uh, this is a major country where, uh, for example, blasphemy is abused, misused uh, by many and, uh, uh, and, and courts have mandatory uh, duty to, to punish by either lifelong imprisonment or death penalty. There is no you know, proportionality, only full capital punishment. And this uh, woman have been falsely accused uh, and twice, twice sued to death in 2009-2010 and she waited for execution or appeal until recently, actually last October 2018, when Supreme Court decided she is innocent, free. But, but uh, uh, she wouldn't uh, survive 24 hours being just free because the rate of hatred, violence against her was and is enormous. I got involved in the case since the beginning because when I was nominated, I tried to get there to start my, my activities with important country. I was not welcomed, but then everything has changed when prolongation of so-called GSP plus agreement was to be made. GSP plus means beneficial trade arrangement for mm -hmm. Pakistan, bringing billions of euros plus surplus to their companies. So they have been uh, interested in, in good relations and we use this momentum for demanding, uh, you know, more justice for all, dignity for all. And this, uh, this notion of dignity, I must say, uh, is much more understood or accepted than just human rights talk. Mm -hmm. Dignity in, in, in Islam is expressed, or in Arabic uh, language, as karama, medabor al kabod in, in Jewish, Different uh, cultures, different um, nations have their expressions for something what is universal, and it is dignity. So I spoke on dignity in Islamabad at the International Human Rights Day, 10th of December 2017. I spoke at the Islamic uh, uh, Center in Punjab, the oldest uh, university in Lahore. And I must say it was received and well received. Uh, in concrete terms, um, when I got there, I made networks. Uh, I argued for, for justice because justice delayed is justice denied. Status quo is not enough. We, as European Union, did not interfere into a judicial process, but we pushed for yeah, action, absolutely. for state responsibility. And it came, as I said, a year ago, and then I was instrumental together with several Western diplomats in securing uh, a safe uh, escape or um, transfer of uh, Asia Bibi and her family to Canada. Well, thank you for your work on that. It's a small example, but it's an important one because I think what we really are worried about is human beings and, uh, uh, and particular people. and. Sometimes it's easier for us to understand the significance of these issues when we focus on uh, particular people. We're just about out of time, but I'd like to ask uh, each of our uh, panelists to respond briefly to uh, a final question. And that is, it can sometimes seem overwhelming or discouraging uh, in the face of 
large-scale global problems. And it's easy to think of ourselves as small and weak and relatively powerless in the face of these just enormous forces that seem so far beyond our control. Um, a religious leader I admired once used the analogy of trying to move a big piano. And there was a lot of discussion about how to affect this difficult task. And finally, someone had the idea to lift where you stand, to simply gather around and to lift where you stand. And I think of that metaphor, that analogy, if you will, for responding. And so my question that I'd like to end with is for ordinary people, people like me, uh, how would you advise me or us to lift where we stand? Uh, so Roger, maybe I can begin with you and then Christina and then Jan will give you the final word. Uh, having been, of course, a private citizen and now in the government, uh, I always appreciate what citizens do either through their vote, their voice, or joining civil society. Uh, we meet with civil society often at the Department of State, and I would say 50% of the time they're uncomfortable meetings, and I'm grateful for every one of them. When I can sit down and someone can maybe sometimes with passion and anger, tell me what they're thinking, what I need to be looking at, and why I'm not doing my job well. So what I would encourage everyone to do is to you know, individually shine a light on, on what they think we should be doing, because we have a lot of resources to bear in terms of money, time, and just organizational capacity. But sometimes what we need is a push, or even with the, your commission, a pointing. You need to go in this direction, and once attuned, we can start going in that direction. Christina, what advice do you have for the ordinary person? Well, one of the greatest feats of um, the last few years in terms of human rights development is the Global Magnitsky Act. And this was a hedge fund manager uh, whose funds were being stolen in Russia. And his attorney, whose name was Sergei Magnitsky, wanted to argue inside the Russian court system for uh, justice and for the right thing to be done. And uh, unfortunately, he was incarcerated and tortured to death. <coughs> so this hedge fund manager who had never worked in human rights issues, who knew nothing about how Congress worked, came to Congress just to tell the story of Sergei Magnitsky. And then he developed the knowledge in order to be able to create a law that has become global so that people who violate human rights, people who violate religious freedom are not able to come and shop Christmas in New York. They're not able to keep their assets in US banks if they're identified. And uh, the Department of Treasury and Commerce now has this powerful tool that, so that they can ensure that they can hit where it hurts. Now Global Magnitsky has been adopted in Canada and there's several countries in South America. And the message there is, not only this will never happen again, but we will make sure that you cannot enjoy the fruits of your abuse by profiting from that abuse in countries that enjoy the democracy and the freedom that you denied people in your own country. Jan, what can the ordinary folks do who might not have the skill set to get Congress to uh, enact a, a new statute? <laughs> I would share one point which I got uh, through my engagement in the last years. Uh, years ago, I, I quoted Elie Wiesel, who used to say that uh, indifference is sister of evil. And that's true. I think we agree. Indifference is sister of evil. But I found out, traveling ar around the world, and especially in, in difficult territories, that evil has more siblings and it's indifference plus ignorance uh, and fear if we don't care if we don't know and if we are scared to do something to say something so my answer is uh, we need to act against those allies of evil through engagement being active do something what we can do, something different can be done by the White House, Congress, Commission, European Union, ordinary people, but everybody can do something. 
Second, we should learn. We should get informed what's going on. Because if there is a, a clash coming, it's not clash of civilizations, but clash of ignorances. Clash of ignorances <laughs> is a real threat. And the third is courage, human courage. Citizen is somebody who has courage and is brave, understanding rules and responsibilities and has courage. So this is my, my simple or ordinary answer in my family, in my community, in Slovakia and in Europe. And I think we, we share these, these views. I feel like among like-minded. Well, I hope that this conversation has done something to bring together those who are not indifferent and to help us address our own ignorance and perhaps to even give us courage uh, to overcome the fear and the sense of uh, powerlessness uh, that, that we may feel. I'm very grateful to Roger Carstens, to Christina Arriaga, to Jan Figuel uh, for joining us. Could I ask you to join me in thanking them for being here with us today? We'd like to conclude by uh, thanking the museum for uh, hosting this uh, discussion. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to be here uh, discussing uh, this uh, very important topic of persecution. And we're grateful for raising our voices for the idea that we indeed want this to be something that stops and that it will be something that we can uh, actually say never again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your being here. And uh, our panelists will be here up front. If you have any questions or would like to uh, share any further ideas with us, we welcome that.